Chancellor. Um, thanks for coming along. And John Burke, the speaker, is not here because he's actually chairing the final session of the Parliament before we go into a short recess. Um, okay. But it's just he's allowed us to use the speaker's accommodation in the apartment, which I think is wonderful. It's just yes. appropriate as well. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, we're here to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the Charter of the Forest. Uh, which is an ex extraordinary document. It's revolutionary in its assertion of the rights of ordinary people to basic subsistence on the land. But the Charter's little known. It's certainly little known. Almost certainly because I think it asserts the rights of ordinary people, while the better known Magna Carta focuses on the rights of the monarchy, the barons, and the church. Uh, my old friend, the late Tony Benn, used to say that the establishment became established because they simply stole the land, <laughs> gave themselves titles, and have been wielding power ever since. Mm -hmm. What the Charter of the Forest was, was a challenge to the then establishment of kings and barons. And I'd like to say if the people could win such rights and change their material circumstances in 1217, surely in 2017, we shall be able to do the same. Mm -hmm. How is it that Britain, the fifth richest country in the world, cannot provide the basic needs of our people? How is it that working families are struggling to survive in this, the fifth richest country in the world, and many are dependent on food banks just to keep going? Mm -hmm. So in 2017, we should be able to expect that poverty and the extreme inequality that we have within our society should be things of the past. But in contemporary Britain, many people face a daily struggle to survive and achieve a decent standard of living. So we felt that we could use this opportunity of the celebration of the Charter to, well, to nourish the growing and social political movement that looks at issues like who owns Britain. And yes, to end the creeping privatisation of our natural assets and our public services that we've witnessed <coughs> over the recent period. So it's through this growing movement we believe we can overcome the corporate privatisation that's blighted our economy and our society. Already this has been launched with our plans for bringing rail and water and Royal Mail and energy back into public ownership. So we want to use this anniversary to revive and to defend the Charter's principles. So let us look, we're discussing public ownership in the context of a new 21st century Charter, a Charter for the people. So we're fortunate now to have a range of absolutely excellent speakers. Um, we'll be inviting the speakers to speak for about 15, 20 minutes, and then there'll be a short period for questions and answers, uh, questions and responses. And then if we've got enough time, um, we'll have a drink at the end, okay? <laughs> <coughs> Our first speaker, speaker is Peter Limbaugh. Peter is a historian living and working from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, in his scholarly endeavours, having contributed in his books to the history of crime in England, he's turned his attention to the history of the commons, convinced that the privatisation of property and the commodity form of human creations are but brief episodes in the overall human drama, and we can assist their exit from the stage, which is the intent of many of us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Two winds, two winds have propelled me here to you, this uh, House of Commons. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. The tempest, or Diabolo, bringing flood and fire of destruction of petrochemical civilization, call it capitalism, signifies destruction in Detroit, Michigan, and Houston, Texas. A second, gentler, softer wind, a zephyr, has renewed my spirit from the Lacandon jungle of Chiapas, where the Zapatista have vowed to protect the forest and reclaim the common land. And from the great plains of North America, where pipelines of oil and gas endangered the rivers and land, encampments of indigenous folks and their allies by prayer and by protest, 
have become water protectors. <laughs> then, day before yesterday, on Guy Fawkes Day, with merry companions indigenous to this, these islands, I visited Sherwood Forest and Laxton, Northamptonshire. And Robin told little John and his merry companion shall not rob. And here I quote from the 14th century jest, the husband that tilleth with his plow or the good a yeoman that walketh by the green wood shaw. Laxton, with its common field and open fields, you know, is the oldest surviving system of agriculture based on the commons and similar to the Ejido of Mexico. And one of the commoners there, Stuart Rose, took us around. And by curious historical coincidence, Laxton lent its name to the town of Lexington in Massachusetts, where in 1775, a shot was fired that was heard around the world. Yeah. <coughs> and this was the day before yesterday. <laughs> and since many thoughts since then have occurred along the journey as I have come at last to you here in this house. Actually, you know, your house has provided me, a stranger, with a kind of home. It was in its public gallery that my mother and father visited regularly in the years 1947 to 1953 to listen to you, and in the pea soup fogs and in the pinching system of food rationing, they were nourished by the crystal clear words, both soft and gentle, that zephyr again, of an iron bevan on behalf of housing and health care for all. Tell it. I was old enough to feel their passions and to identify it seemed, with the common people, because I was informed by my school chums up in St. John's Wood that as an American, I was common. <laughs> <laughs> so propelled by these words of disaster and memories of defense, I have become one of the scholarly vectors of a planetary discussion of the commons that began before the 6th of November, 1217, and it's our duty to see that it continues well after us. We do that work again in commemoration of the Charter of the Forest, the little companion, as you said, of the bigger ch charter. These charters of English history began in 1215 as an armistice to end a civil war and quickly became a treaty in 1217 when war was resumed, developed a legislative appearance in 1225, that was the time of the real Robin Hood, <laughs> became something, the first statute of English law by 1290, mutated into something constitutional, curtailing despotism by 1640, and a mere nine years later formed part of the indictment for treason <coughs> against Charles Stuart. It then went offshore. Enlightenment project of the American Revolution of 1776 blew the horn of jubilee with the emancipation of American slaves in 1865, blowing back against empire in national liberation, led by Gandhi, Mandela, and Sun Yat-sen, and from them returned to the anti-fascist North Atlantic in the four freedoms of FDR and the Atlantic Charter of 1941. Are you following? Yeah. Yeah. Becoming part of the welfare state of that war, and so on to us. I was just trying to hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Where we're here. Yes. Brilliant. Right. <laughs> now let me thank you for indulging me to read. It will be noticed how the word common and its derivatives appear and reappear like a theme throughout the centuries, wrote Edgell Whitward in the Handbook of Freedom found in the kit of boys going off to war in 1939. Yeah. It was for the once vast commons, common lands that the peasants took up arms. It was as the true commons that they spoke of themselves when they assembled. And it was the aspiration of men not corrupted by petty proprietorship that all things should be in common. Mm -hmm. William Blake, the whole duty of man is art and all things in common. 
Percy Shelley, back from Ireland, the rights of men are liberty and an equal participation in the commonage of nature. And William Morris, in his Fabian tract of 1903, concluded, the rights of nature, therefore, and the wealth used for the production of further wealth, in short, the plant and the stock, should be communized. Mm. Now, um, yeah, that's good. <laughs> we want to turn this commons into action, into a verb, just as Morris turned communism into an action, a verb. Mm. Let's see. The sweetest thing about the forest charter is honey for free men. Mm. And the most human thing is the abolition of the death penalty for forest offenses. Yeah. Mm. It is true there are arcane words, but these are quite understandable once we understand that this is not a neoliberal document, one recognizing, but is one recognizing a common mode of production and reproduction. To give us an idea of the power of this short document, it's only about a foot square, let me read the first of its 17 chapters. And while you listen, see whether you can hear the principles which our chair, uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you, um, asked us to attend to. Principles that I hear are the first, the principle of reparation, that is giving back, the principle of assembly, that is direct democracy, and the principle of the commons. So I quote, in the first place, <coughs> All the forests which Henry, our grandfather, afforested shall be visited by good and lawful men. And if he afforested any woodland other than that of his own domain to the damage of him to whom the woodland belonged, let it be disafforested. And if he afforested his own proper woodland, let it remain forest, saving common of herbage and other things in the same forest to those who were accustomed to have them before. I want us to, well, I don't need. Now in this house, it is the principle of the commons I want to elaborate. In the words of governance and assembly, swanimo, verderers, regarders, and gisters need not detain us now nor need we delve further into the meanings of asarts, adjustments, <coughs> and perpetrators, <laughs> apart from saying that they have to do, again, depending on the locality, with grubbing, grazing, and building. Mm -hmm. But what concerns us is meat and drink, house and health. We are led to them by the terms herbage, panage, chiminage, estovers, and the green hue. The gift of a cow is milk and cheese. The gift of a pig is pork <coughs> and bacon. These are made possible by herbage and panage. Estovers is a, actually is a term not from the Charter of the Forest, but from its big sister, the Magna Carta, chapter 7. And it lets us build our houses, pillar and post and roof, and furnish our assemblies and homes <coughs> with table and chairs. You might gather wood for these purposes and for others too, especially for widows. And I recently learned from Bracton, the 13th century English jurist, Estovers were also for prisoners who might participate through their family with this common. One can hardly overemphasize their importance. Edward Cook, I think he was the speaker, was he not? Maybe, yes. And do I say Cook or Coke? Coke, sorry. Uh, Coke interpreted them as sustenance, which covers heat and fuel. And in French, I, I learned from Guy the other day, up, up in Sherwood Forest, meant necessities. And what is necessary to human survival in addition to protein and carbohydrates of panage and, and herbage is good health. 
and this too might be obtained in the forest by the custom of chiminage, allowing you to walk on its ways, as long as it was not for commercial purposes. <coughs> the green hue of the forest provided a vast pharmacopoeia, or place of medicinals. So I have posited for us three principles, restoration, assembly, and I've brought this assembly in this house attention to the principle of the commons. I then explicated the arcane terms which, which describe the power of the commons to food and drink, home and health, or panage, herbage, and esto. This has been the text. Now, briefly, the context. It requires us to remember that at that time in history, there, were, there was no Hollywood, <laughs> and no President Trump, <laughs> but Church and King. And those two sides of the ruling class battled the commons for land and soul. The king at the time was a child, so he did not seal the charter. Instead, Gualo Bicireri, the papal legate, fixed his seal on the vellum. The charter of the forest, you see, is a document of Europe. Moreover, it's a document of European class struggle. For it was this same Gualo Bicireri who a few years earlier had helped to organize the woeful massacre of the Cathars in Provence and the Languedoc. These so-called heretics were commoners, vegetarians, feminists, anti-imperialists, and refusers to become crusaders. However, they, like the just commons of England, had the bottle to battle the powers that be. The bottle. They had the neck. <laughs> they had the neck to do it. And I'm almost done, except for one last, last point. Remembering the winds. This document grants liberties, but we know the ruling class always says that it grants it. But they had to say why. And they said, for the salvation of our soul and the souls of our ancestors and our successors. So I put it to us. And you said, that's sounding Emotion. rhetorical <laughs> in the way that this house has, <laughs> has done. But I put it for our discussion that our souls are in danger on our Mother Earth. And I really look forward to hearing from the others. Our next speaker is Guy Standing. Let me go through his, some of his titles, just some of them. He's Professorial Research Associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies, the SOAS, University of London. He's Fellow of the British Academy of Social Sciences, co-founder and now honorary co-president of the Basic Income Earth Network, international NGO which promotes basic income. <coughs> He's written a couple of recent books. One of them is Corruption of Capitalism, which has been extraordinarily influential in stimulating the debate in this country and elsewhere. And also his latest book is Basic Income, and how we can make it happen. And Guy has become one of our advisors on how we take these ideas forward. Guy. Thank you very much, John, and thank you, Peter, for a, a stirring speech, which goes with his wonderful book, The Magna Carta Manifesto. I have been working for over 30 years on basic income. And when we set up our network, Bien, where anybody can join, 31 years ago, we started a game on the side. Who was the originator of basic income? And we looked at Thomas More, Tom Paine, G.D.H. Cole, various names in history. But I want to nominate 
William Marshall. I'll come to William Marshall in just a second, because William Marshall was the regent of that ten-year-old king on November the 6th. Imagine the scene. In St. Paul's Cathedral, the original St. Paul's, a ten-year-old boy probably didn't know what was happening, almost certainly didn't, bemused. And this cardinal probably didn't know that much either, but William Marshall was the spirit who forced through two Magna Cartas that day. Because before November 6th, 1217, what we know as the Magna Carta had been called the Charter of Liberties. <coughs> but on that morning, it became the Magna Carta. And William Marshall and the Cardinal put their seals to that charter. And they also put their seals to a second Magna Carta. It was called the Magna Carta de Forrester. What we now know as the Charter of the Forest was actually sealed alongside the Magna Carta. Yesterday I had the enormous privilege of speaking in Durham Cathedral on the anniversary day and Christian Liddy invited me to speak there. And we had in front of us the 1216 version of what became the Magna Carta alongside the 1217 Charter of the Forest. And it was very relevant, I think, that the condition of the Magna Carta was much better than the condition of the Charter of the Forest. Because over the centuries, the Charter of the Forest has suffered. But from the day it was sealed, it became part of the British Constitution. And it was interesting that in June 2015, when the government was lavishing large amounts of money for celebrations in Runnymede and elsewhere, some of us were in an eco-village above Runnymede, yep. <laughs> <laughs> looking down from what was the commons, an occupied village of 300 people. It was very symbolic. And the Minister of Justice, a Lord Fawkes, in the House of Lords, was asked in a tabled question, written question, were the government going to have similar celebrations for the Charter of the Forest in 2017? <laughs> the noble Lord, in his infinite wisdom, dismissed the idea airily, saying it is not relevant, it is not important, and has no international implications. Interesting statement. So when I read that earlier this year, and we were beginning our activities, which led to our barge trip to Runnymede, to our Sherwood visit, to the Durham visit, and the Lincoln Conference is going to be next Saturday. All of these events linked together. I wrote, first of all, to Noam Chomsky. I said to him, do you think it's irrelevant? Could you write us a tribute? He wrote back, he said, delighted to do so. I said, just two lines. Typically, he wrote half a page, <laughs> saying how important it was. I then wrote to the American Bar Association. Oh, quite a, an illustrious body. They wrote back and said, the Charter of the Forest was instrumental in the development of the US Constitution. <coughs> Lord Fulks says it's unimportant. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is that the Charter of the Forest has been regarded by many, many people historians, distinguished historians, as the first environmental charter in history. The first charter to say that we must protect nature, protect animals, make sure we focus on reproducing nature. 
not depleting it. That principle is embedded in the charter of the forest. It's not unimportant, I would say. And of course, in that process, we, we see that they set up a common stewardship principle. We didn't need Eleanor Ostrom, who went on to receive a Nobel Prize in economics, for saying that there wasn't a tragedy of the commons if you had a stewardship that preserved the resources and looked after the balance of nature and human needs. Very nicely embedded in the charter is a concept of the verderers. The verderers initially were for the protection of the animals, particularly the deer and the boar, but other animals as well. Interestingly, by the Elizabethan age, they also became responsible, they were given terms of reference, for looking after the subsistence needs of the commoners in the commons. Very important sort of balance of environment and human needs. The second first is this was the first charter asserting the rights of the property less. In a sense, you can see the Magna Carta as asserting property rights and civil rights. But the, the Charter of the Forest was essentially about the rights of the property less. Never been done before. Remarkable. And in that regard, as Peter has mentioned, it has this wonderful concept of dis disafforestation. You have to bear in mind that after the bandits of William the Conqueror came in 1066, they dispersed a large part of what was the commons to their friends and relations. And just to give you a little bit of modern relevance for that, the late and much lamented Duke of Westminster, much lamented, <laughs> he was asked, asked by a young entrepreneurial type, he said, what advice have you got to become a successful entrepreneur? <laughs> and he, in his dotage, said, be a descendant of a friend of William the Conqueror. <laughs> <laughs> but the incredible thing was that here was a charter in 1217. It was clearly a class-based charter because it said the monarchy had to give back over a hundred forests. Remarkable. Really radical document. And although they resisted to a certain extent, I think it was only because the king was ten years old that it happened. When he became an adult, he realized what had happened, and when he had to put his own seal on it, he spent the rest of his 56 years on the throne trying desperately to repeal the <laughs> Charter of the Forest. I don't know why, but what is great is that he failed every single time because it had been part of a social compact made in the aftermath of not only a civil <clears throat> war but between John and the barons, but also the last actual invasion of England and the Battle of Lincoln. We have a lot of people from Lincoln today, yeah. so I know you will be celebrating. The Battle of Lincoln of May 1217 was a decisive defeat for the French invasion. Yeah. But of course, the civil wars and that battle and the defeat of the French had left a lot of widows. And it's extraordinary that the one demographic group that gets particular attention both in the Magna Carta and in the Charter of the Forest are widows. And you can say without too much hyperbole that this was the first feminist charter. Because up to that day, November the 6th, 1217, women were regarded as chattels without any rights, without any sense of being a citizen at all. 
But that day, it was said that widows had the right to refuse to be remarried against their will, and the right to estevars in the common, to reasonable estevars, the exact words used. And reasonable estevars meant subsistence. So you can see that it was an advance for feminism. Not a big advance, but for the time, huge advance. Lord Fawkes would ne'er say that was unimportant and had no international <laughs> ramifications, etc. Now, the next thing is why, for me personally, the Charter of the Forest is very special. This is the first charter in history to assert that every free man and free woman has the right to subsistence. Mm. The right to subsistence. And it's very, very specific. It's actually more specific than in the Magna Carta. <coughs> it's specific because, as Peter has mentioned, it says that people have the right to herbage, to the right to have access to fruit and, and things growing for food. In, in the commons. It has a right to panage, feeding your pigs with the acorns in the autumn. A right to piscary, in other words, a right to fish, to take fish from the water. A right to turbury, to take peat for fuel, to heat your home. A right to estevars that we've talked about, which is the right to have access to necess necessities, and in particular wood. Very critical for today's debate about urban trees and so on. The right to take the lower branches and the wood that falls off the trees for making your house, for making your carts, for making your doors, for doing making your tools. And beautifully, the right to mall. The right to mall meant that you had the right to take clay from the ground and minerals, including coal from underneath the ground. See the modern remnants? Of course. The right to mull because you needed to make clay pots, you needed utensils. It was part of your absolute needs. Very vital in that regard. Now, all of those rights meant that the commoners could find their means of survival. They could get access to the critical things. But it's actually even more radical than that. Because unlike the Communist Manifesto or the Soviet Constitution or a number of other laborist documents, it asserted, in effect, the right to work. Mm -hmm. The right to have access to raw materials and the right to have access to means of production for producing and reproducing yourself. And it is an assertion of use value over exchange value, which any Marxist can understand. This is vital in understanding why we need a commons. It was also a very important step in the advancing of Republican Republican freedom is something the left understands. Mm. It's not a libertarian freedom, it's not a liberal freedom. Republican freedom means the right to be in the public facing non-domination or the possibility of domination. It's a very important interpretation and in a sense you can trace it through to Hannah Arendt's famous statement, the right to have rights beautiful strain of thought with Republican freedom. Now, I wish Mr. Lord Fuchs was here today, because I'd like to shove the whole lot of the argument <laughs> I've made in his no doubt delightful face. Maybe he's a friend of John, so I should be careful. <laughs> he's not, he's not a member of the same party. Now, the charter, the charter of the forest has suffered egregiously over the centuries. 
It had already survived the first plunder of the commons, the first enclosures that William the Conqueror started. That was the first wave of enclosures. To a certain extent, it rolled it back, but even during Henry III's reign, he introduced some measures to limit giving it back. But of course, it didn't compare anything with the Tudors. Henry VIII essentially took 10 million acres of land, which he handed out to his favorites. <coughs> 10 million acres. They hadn't worked a single day unless you count killing as working. Those 10 million acres was a huge wave of enclosures. The second or third wave of enclosures was done by Cromwell after 1649, when he handed out a large amount of land to another bunch of bourgeois. The capitalist system was developing. And then, of course, then, of course, we have the fourth wave, which was in the 19th century, when over 5,000 enclosure acts were passed, all of the dukes and the lords and things helping each other and voting them through, by which another 7 million acres were transferred to landowners. <laughs> but in a sense, today, and this is where I'm going to be ending, we are facing the fifth wave hmm. of the plunder of the commons. Since 2010, accelerated by austerity and the phony logic of austerity, the government has been forcing local councils and other bodies to commercialize their parks, to commercialize the libraries, to sell them off to foreign multinationals, to enclose the urban commons with pops, Pops are all around us, privately owned public spaces. Our cities, our squares, our streets are suddenly being turned into privately owned sources of profit. And we have the sadness of thousands and thousands of urban trees, the care of which is being privatized through PFI and other means so that they can cut down trees worth millions and replace them with spindly things or nothing at all. Mm. It's happening not only in Sheffield, in Wandsworth, in Tooting Common, it's happening all over the country and is accelerating. We are losing our commons. Today only 3% of the country is still commons in terms of land, but we have the social commons that are being taken away, we have the urban commons taken away, we have the cultural commons weakened, yeah. and we have the intellectual commons being privatized for the source of problems. Mm. It's a real plunder of the commons that we must confront. And that is why, with John's blessing, some of us are helping to develop a charter for the commons for the 21st century. Because unless we confront it very directly and very aggressively, we're going to see the rest of our commons lost as well. But I think the public mood is turning very rapidly and we're going to defend our commons Absolutely. and revive them. Thank you very much for listening. Project lead, on, project lead on the Charter for Trees, Woods and People. The Woodland Trust is calling for a Charter for Trees, Woods and People to be launched in November this month, this year, to mark the 800th anniversary of the 1217 Charter of the Forest. Thank you very much. Um, do I need the microphone or can everyone hear me? Well, if it's recording, it would be good. If it's a magnifier, you don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah. I? Yes, no, yes. I'll hold it just in case. I'm not quite sure what the general <laughs> mood was there. Um, so thank you very much for an invitation uh, to speak here. It's a great honour. Um, at first, those of you that might know quite a lot about the Charter of the Forest, and I think now we could say that everyone in the room does, 
um it might seem that i'm here by accident. i'm here from the woodland trust, a conservation charity that is focused on trees and woods and of course at first that might seem that my invitation has been the result of a misunderstanding of what forest meant in one seventeen because we know that it was the term for the royal forest, it was a landscape it it wasn't what it means now which is a forest and a large population of trees in one space but of course we've also heard from from guy um about some of the rights that were enshrined by that charter of the forest we've heard how relevant trees and woods were to what people needed to be able to get from the landscape for their livelihood and their well-being we've heard about panage if you kept pigs and you couldn't go into your local wood uh, for them to be able to feed off uh, acorns and beech nuts to get through the the autumn and the winter uh, then of course you couldn't feed your family that was your livelihood if you couldn't go in uh, and, and do estova and, and get uh, firewood and wood to build and repair your home then you didn't have warmth you didn't have shelter we've relied on trees for warmth and shelter and food since the very earliest days of our species it's the first interspecies relationship that humankind has had and the charter of the forest of 1217 made it abundantly clear that that relationship was still integral to our well-being and those rights that were being taken away by denial of access to the forest and to the woods and trees within it could not be stood by the population of the time and hence the king as you say uh, was effectively forced to sign it um, and it uh, remained in force um, it, much of it in force until the 1970s so what we've got in this 800th anniversary of the charter of the forest is a glimpse back in history to a time when trees and woods were essential to people's lives to look forward with that in mind are we looking at a similar situation or are those things that we depended on for trees a thing of the past how many of us can say that if we need to heat our homes we go out into our local wood and collect the firewood ourselves how many of us perform our own repairs to our houses uh, by going out and collecting uh, wood from the nearby forest how many of us go and forage for our own food and how many of us instead go to supermarkets and buy farm food but what we do know now 800 years on is just how much we as a species and as individual people truly depend on trees and woods and it's in different ways from the way that we understood it 800 years ago we understand that by going out into a woodland our mental health is directly improved and I don't just mean it's nice to be outside it's it's nice to be amongst trees um, there's actually a scientific uh, many scientific studies that show that this is a direct physical response to being amongst trees things like citherism the sound of uh, wind in the, the leaves of trees have a direct effect on your brain and help you more able to deal with stressful situations make you calmer more able to process information even the view of trees through a window has some of this effect uh, classrooms which have views uh, of, of green space and trees um, pupils will be able to concentrate better students will be able to find uh, that they can work harder with without uh, as much stress and with with better mental health the effects become even even more extreme and um, we're in a, a beautiful wooden paneled room here mm. having wood grain in view in your inside space even if you can't see a living tree through the window even that is having a positive effect on your mental health and these are things which affect all of us whatever your livelihood if you do make your living by going out and collecting wood and uh, uh, cutting down trees and selling the wood the chances are you're doing that on private land in a plantation forest and, and it's, a, it's a private concern so it's very different from the kind of commons rights that we're exploring today but nevertheless forestry as an industry is a form of uh, support for so many people that depend on it for their livelihoods and yet mm. it is unsupported um, it is declining because fewer and fewer people are taking up uh, courses that would lead them into that, those industries people are feeling that trees are less relevant to their lives they're feeling that wood is less relevant to today but they're wrong and we need to reconnect and discover that in fact trees and woods around us are as integral as they ever were but just for different reasons and it was fantastic to hear the reference uh, by Guy to, to the, the threats facing urban trees. And uh, 
Sheffield in particular has, has made the, the, the headlines recently just simply because it has been such a huge, large-scale and sustained assault, not only on those urban trees, but on people's rights to have a say in the urban trees on which they personally depend for that mental health, for the beauty of their streets. I mean, imagine if you've spent money to buy a house in a street because it's a beautiful, leafy, canopied street, and then one day, without any say in it yourself, you wake up to find that tree outside your house has been felled. All the trees on your streets have been felled. Your walk to work is completely different. Your mental health suffers, and not only from the fact that you're no longer walking in the canopy of trees, but because you felt disempowered by not having had a say in the, uh, the fate of the tree which has become your lifelong friend. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things which affect us today. And we're not just talking about urban trees, we're talking about uh, woodlands that cover the landscape. We have 13% woodland cover in the UK against a European average of 37%. That's abysmal. Um, only 37% of what we do have is publicly accessible, that's the public forest estates. And a lot of you will remember what happened in 2010 um, when the government uh, planned to sell off some of the public forest estates in England. Uh, the outcry was a real wake-up call. It was a wake-up call for the government, but it was a wake-up call for conservation charities like ourselves. And it was very encouraging to see that people still cared about access to woodland. And of course, in these days, we're talking about access to woodland for very different reasons. People didn't need to go in there. In fact, they probably weren't allowed to go in there and just collect wood and, and, and take their pigs in. However, they still wanted access. They wanted access for the pleasure of walking amongst trees. And so we start to get a sense that this is still important, it's still current, and it is under threat. The woods that we do have are increasingly under threat. Ancient woodland, our most precious 2% of UK cover is ancient woodland, which means it's more than 400, 500 years old, possibly much, much older. 2% cover is tiny. That's clear. We have more than 780 woods currently under threat on our books at the Woodland Trust, from development, from planning. What kind of priorities do we have as a society? The thousands, the hundreds of thousands of people that depend on the woods that are closest to them risk losing all of the benefits that I outlined at the beginning because without their say-so, they're being taken from the landscape and replaced with commodities. So with this context, yesterday, the 800th anniversary of the signing of the 1217 Charter of the Forest was also a landmark day for another reason. I was in Lincoln Castle, site of one of the last two remaining 1217 Charter of the Forest. This guy was with the other one in Durham. Um, and we were celebrating not only the 800th anniversary of the Charter, which we did by processing across from the, from the old cathedral through to the castle walls, headed by Robin Hood with his hunting horn as a reminder <laughs> of the forests of old uh, and all the associations that they have. We moved into the castle and we celebrated the launch of a new charter, a charter for trees, woods and people. And this was marked in a very different way by speakers from all walks of life, including Sheffield campaigners, including hip hop artists that are engaging young people um, in urban uh, environments in London with growing food and, and with the value of trees, with orchard projects, um, all sorts of different people coming together in celebration of what trees and woods mean to us now. So this charter now exists. You can go and see the actual artwork. This is just a, a small print of it, and I have more of these if anyone would like to take one away tonight. Um, beautiful artwork created um, not only um, in beautiful calligraphy by Patricia Lovett, who's a fantastic calligrapher, um, but also written in oak gold ink, which I don't think any of the speakers have mentioned so far was, was what the Magna Carta would have been written in and, of course, what the Charter of the Forest would have been written in. Oak galls being basically wasp eggs that grow on oak trees and when the wasp has exited, you can grind them down and turn them into ink, uh, the ink that all of our most uh, historic documents were written in. Wow. Um, so a bit of a link with the past there, but also a link, of course, with our connections with trees. So I won't go through uh, the charter in detail because you can all see it yourself at treecharter.uk. I'll also say um, that it's not signed with a royal seal. It doesn't come with government endorsement at this point. We hope that it will be an inspiration <laughs> for many policies to come. Um, instead, it is backed by the signatures of more than 100,000 people and with the backing of more than 70 organisations representing um, a multitude of sectors. The Woodland Trust didn't write this. 
uh, the Woodland Trust brought together a consortium of organisations right. representing all sorts of different uh, sectors across, uh, across the country. Forestry, um, the National Union of Students, uh, community woodland groups, health, um, we know how important trees are to healthcare, um, and even uh, other groups like um, uh, the Black Environment Network, the Druid groups, and so on. Um, so all I will read you at this stage is just the 10 principles that underpin it. And these 10 principles didn't just come from these organizations, as, manif uh, as, uh, as many as there are of them. We wanted it to be uh, much broader than that. Instead, we reached out um, over more than a year and asked people to send in their stories of trees and woods in their lives and why they're important to them so that we could create a charter that genuinely was for what people today value about trees and woods and what rights they think they should have to them. So these principles were defined by an evaluation, by a study and an analysis of those 60,000 plus stories that we received. <coughs> and they come with a lovely um, blurb that's written by the author Fiona Stafford for each one to kind of explain what it means in practice with terminology, vocabulary inspired by those stories. But I'll just read the headers because you can read the detail yourself. The first one, sustain landscapes rich in wildlife. Two, plant for the future. Our planting figures in this country, as you may have read by recent headlines, are not enough to sustain even what we have, and we're in danger of falling into a state of deforestation in the modern sense. Three, celebrate, celebrate the power of trees to inspire. Four, grow forests of opportunity and innovation. Five, protect irreplaceable trees and woods. Six, plan greener local landscapes. Seven, recover health, hope, and well-being with the help of trees. Seven, make trees accessible to all. Eight, I've missed one, obviously. Nine, combat the threats to our habitats. And 10, strengthen our landscapes with trees. Each of them quite broad, and you can drill into the detail online, but that just gives us a little indication of just how much trees and woods are relevant to us today and how much our rights to them deserve to be protected. So I'll leave it there, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. I should say, um, can think of been mentioned, we've got Karen Lee here, who's the UMP for Lincoln as well. Right. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you. Thank you. The as well have joined us too, we with us on, on Friday. Our next speaker is Julie Timberall. Julie's an activist and founder member of the New Putney Debates, which came out of the Occupy movement. New Putney Debates use social history to provide a forum for debates in order to better understand our social history, learn from the past, and collectively find contemporary solutions. Julie. Thank you. Um, and they were fiercely guarded by Londoners, um, and we were very 
conscious um, of, of, of um, our, the commons that we created. So I, I think I, we talked a lot about commons here, and I wanted to think about how Occupy London was a form of commons. It was a political and it was a social commons that we created through the libraries, um, through the Tenth City University, um, through the food that we cooked together. And it was, um, although we came together um, with a shared desire to act, we didn't come with an equal understanding of injustices, but we learned that together we had a leavening as we sort of had our debates and we had our education there, and we learned things. Um, and um, we learned things were actually, in my case, a lot worse than they thought they actually were. <laughs> I knew there was climate change, but I turned out that there was actually a sixth mass extinction. Um, I knew that the bankers. Um, had um, robbed us blind, but what I didn't realise um, until, until I, read, I read my leading list and Thomas Saxon and um, Treasure Island was actually the city of London is um, more or less a tax haven and um, its remit is just about neoliberalism the globe over. And these, these are all things that I learned there. Um, and that was a contradiction, really. A one, a one, in one sense, I learned that the city of London was. Um, the first democracy, um, considered itself to be a commune, but then it was also the site of, um, of some of the worst, um, the worst crimes, really, that were being perpetuated on us and, and globally. Um, so I, I've been thinking about that recently, preparing my talk about why, why, what, what was, why, why did that change? And we, we had at one point we had this commune. Um, of, of um, the city of London, and that changed at some point. Um, so one one thing, one point it did change, I think, was um, something that Peter Linebaum drew to my attention um, was that um, there was the first book of the governor happened by uh, St Thomas Eliot in 1531, and at that point he distinguishes between um, the Red Republic and the commune. And he says that the rest public is the place of property. It's the property people and the, pro and the, and the proper purpose of, um, of that group of people is to pursue profit. And it's not the same as the commune, the common people. And it isn't the same as commonwealth or pursuing the commonwealth. He distinguishes those two things. And this is during the time of the Tudors. Um, and I don't think that's um, a coincidence, uh, that that is also the time when the first mass enclosures started, that Guy spoke about. Um, it's also the time of the rise of witchcraft, um, when the Hammer of the Witch was published. Um, the time, and feminist scholars have brought those two things together as well. But the, that the persecution of women and the, person, and the enclosure of the commons are two linked things because they are about um, destroying the reproduction of life itself. Um, so the, I, though this, this, um, this um, move that, that the city of London was um, a place of property in search of profit was the thing that I think we came to occupy London um, or discovered while we were there. And that we saw that this was trumping everything, that the pursuit of profit was trumping everything, and that they were starting to destroy the basis of life itself as well. Um, and when, when we were evicted, there was a common statement that you can't evict an idea. Um, but some, and we carried on, and I wanted to talk about some of the movements that have since come. So the, in, in, we, we held common cause with the indignados in Spain at that time, and the indignados in Spain went out. And they started to build different movements like Podemos, like 15M. Um, they also started defending their homes because in Spain a lot of people were being evicted from their homes. And there was a big um, solidarity network to defend um, from the, the banks taking back their homes because they decided that actually um, protecting people's homes was more important than paying back the debt. And in Barcelona there was uh, an amazing housing network and other social groups. And a few years ago, they formed together a movement called Barcelona in Common, a citizens' platform, and they formed an alliance. And now they're starting to run 
from that city using that alliance, using that citizens platform. And they're developing, um, uh, what they are doing as, as a forefront is um, putting first and central participative democracy, which is very like we do. We were there debating things, getting involved in decision making, and that's exactly what they're doing. They're also really placing a primacy on honesty and accountability, because in Spain, corruption is a very big thing. So they're doing those things, and I think that is um, one of the, uh, they are sort of manifesting some of the ideas that we had at that time. Um, the other thing I think is comparable to that is what's happening here in England with the DIY democracy movement that's happening at Frome, that some of you may know about, where local people have got together and they've um, taken over their council and they choose local people to run that council. And very similarly to what's happening in Barcelona in Common, they sit down and they work through decisions with local people, with staff, and they develop an idea of how they actually want their community. And I think those are the kind of things that will prevent what's happening in Sheffield and prevent those trees being knocked down, where people are actually involved in decision making and they're not outsourced to representatives to sit in committees alone. Um, so I think that that is another very similar um, thing that's happened. Um, another, another more developed commons movement is in Italy, where they have a mature movement, a much more mature movement of the commons. They've started to develop legal instruments so that social centres there can be supported. Um, they've also, again, participation is absolutely central. They have agreements about regeneration. So if there's a regeneration plan, there has to be complete transparency about what goes on. There has to be opportunities to participate. It has to be a community plan. I mean, wouldn't we just love that in regeneration in London? I mean, we've seen that as a central issue for many, many Londoners, where regeneration plans come along and people just do not feel that it represents what they actually want. Um, the other one, the other thing I think we have we took inspiration from and can still be inspired from is um, the US Community Bill of Rights. Um, so I've got one of the examples here, um, and that's about giving rights. Um, one of those things is about communities coming together, and one of the principles that they often have here is rights for nature, um, which mirrors things that have happened in Ecuador and other places. So I'm going to read out one of the statements. It's a sort of a draft statement. It says, ecosystems and natural communities within the community possess inalienable rights to exist and flourish. The rights of rivers, streams, and aquifers will include the right to sustainable recharge and flow sufficient to protect native fish and habitat in clean water. Your community and any resident in your York community <coughs> or group of residents have standing to enforce and protect these rights. So there's also an idea that these are these are rights for nature, but rights that you have a responsibility to safeguard um, as well. Um, and I think that's a shift in view. It's not just human rights. It's about thinking about us as interdependent with, with other species and with the natural world. Um, uh, in, 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 U, in the UK, there has been a fall capture to which Mottia over here um, may get a chance to mention later, which is, is where local people came together in a similar way as uh, the Community Bills of Rights to protect against extreme energy. And they set out and established um, what their community thought was um, the tangible and intangible assets and did a very uh, powerful statement that they would protect them, again, balancing rights and responsibilities. Um, we have here some, some local groups like Take Back the City, identifying really important things like basic needs, like housing, um, and we have some local groups as well. So there are many uh, groups that are coming together to try and work on a community level, which I think shows um, some similarities of things. The similarities, I think, is that most of these movements talk about housing and um, as, a, as a basic right and something that, and regeneration is something that we need to have control over and we need to have be, be, be part of. They also talk about um, balancing rights and responsibilities. And they also talk about uh, human and natural rights being together as one. Well. So those are just some examples I think of community chances that are developing. Thanks, Julia. The final presentation from Guy 
Guy Shopsoul and Anne Arne Smith. Guy is a writer and campaigner and blogs at Who Owns England and he's well known as a campaigner at Friends of the Earth. Anna Powell Smith is a programmer and data analyst, analyst who runs a data visualization consultancy for Who Owns England and Anna builds the maps and more recently has analyzed all the data. Over to you. Did we get both? Um, yes. Yeah. If you both working. Thanks. Brilliant. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm going. Uh, I'm Anna. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who owns England? Um, so we don't actually know who um, we're, we're trying to uh, find out who does owning. So we've, we've we've heard from previous speakers about the enclosures uh, of the past uh, centuries and uh, how the aristocracy. Um, basically were involved in land grabs in, uh, in previous centuries in England and other parts of the United Kingdom. And who owns England is actually one of the, the darkest and oldest secrets I think that this country has. It's incredibly hard to find out now who owns England nowadays. And a little bit over a year ago, um, I set up a blog uh, to, like, to start investigating this issue. And I started putting in freedom of information requests, first to public bodies, to try and find out what they owned, um, trying to get them to send me maps of what they had. But they ended up sending me loads of data that I really wanted to make into a map that I just did not have the skills to make. So I talked to Anna, who definitely does have those skills, and um, this is what we've been making. Uh, so when it loads, um, we mapped roughly 10% of the area in Wales uh, from going to the wire requests. So we know what the Crown Estate owns, we know, we know what the Ministry of Defence owns, we know what the Forestry Commission owns. Um, we know what um, overseas companies own. This is the work that was a few years ago. Um, and if you go to whoonsengland.org, you can see it all and explore it. Um, it's interactive, so you can zoom in. This is central London, where we are now. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this at the back. Um, the orange is uh, government buildings. Uh, the red is overseas companies. Purple is the Crown Estate, so you can see Crown Estate in multiple Thames, only a lot of Regent Street, St James's. Um, if you zoom in, this is St James's. Uh, the purple is the Crown Estate, and the red is overseas companies. Here's Whitehall, the government owns the Whitehall, you expect. Uh, the MOD and the MOD building. Um, we'll try and interact, which is never a good idea. Um, uh, so if you click on things, you can see you're going to work. It wasn't that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if you go, you can see what we know, which is only 10%, because we don't know who owns the remainder. Um, so we don't know what UK companies own at the moment, and we don't know what individuals own. So um, one of the things that we don't know very much about, apart from in certain places, is, is what um, the aristocracy owned and what um, sort of new, 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 newly um, rich individuals owned. This is a map we have been able to put together of um, a place I grew up, which is West Berkshire. Um, bit of audience interaction. Who do you think owns the most land in West Berkshire? Royal Richard Bailey. Correct. Richard Benning MP, the MP for Newbury, which is there. Jeez. Now, Newbury, just briefly, this is Newbury and Thatcham. That's where 40% of the population of West Berkshire live. And just 30 landowners, including Richard Benning MP, own half the county. This is Richard Benning's land over here. All the Jeez. So it's very, very concentrated. So did they inherit that? Sorry. He <laughs> uh, inherited it from his great great grandfather, who was also Richard Benyon MP. <laughs> 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 and then you've been looking into some of the, the, the enclosure maps. Yeah, we have an enclosure map from the 19th century um, of uh, Richard Benyon's enclosures. <laughs> okay. It's coming to So, yes, um, as you can see from this example, land ownership in this county, at the very least, in West Berkshire, is incredibly concentrated still. And I'd be very surprised if the same wasn't true of every other county in England. Um, I think on the next one, we've got... 
So, uh, <laughs> so um, it's also, we're also really interested in, um, uh, in who owns empty homes in London. And uh, you might have seen this investigation um, that we worked with, uh, on the, with the Guardian, uh, worked on with the Guardian earlier this summer. Um, and actually, we got sent the data by accident um, by uh, the FBI officer for Kensington and Chelsea. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's still his post. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it basically revealed um, how, how many of these empty properties, about 1,500 or so empty properties in Kensington and Chelsea, obviously, this is the borough in which Grendel Tower uh, is in, was in. And um, a lot of these owners of empty properties are extremely wealthy um, billionaires based in the UK or, or overseas. No, we won't, we won't try to map that because the uh, information on uh, where that was is owned by the survey and that's not it, so we can only show you what we've got, I'm afraid. So really, just wanted to close with just a few thoughts about what we really need if we really want to complete this, this new germ study, if you like, of, of trying to work out who owns England nowadays. Um, one of the things is that we, we really need the land registry, which is meant to be the guardian of, of all the information in England and Wales about property and, and land to be opened up and to be completely open. Um, yeah. 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 So we had a nice um, They were nice saying they're releasing some corporate data and some overseas companies data, which is good news. Um, it's not really adequate because it doesn't have any geographic information in it, so it's very partial. Uh, we really need geographic information to be released. Um, if we did that, we'd know a lot more about your own land, what we can do with land, how we can tax it better, how we can use it better. Um, it would also unlock a lot of commercial potential. It's just really something we've got to do. And I think we just also say it's absolutely fantastic the interest that uh, the Labour Party is taking in exploring things like land tax, <laughs> looking at land ownership. Um, it, was, it was brilliant that after the um, story came out about empty homes in Kensington, Chelsea, that um, I think actually there was a, a bit of a bidding war between parties about actually how much we should be taxing empty properties <laughs> after that, which was fantastic to hear. And obviously, if, if there is an interest uh, in any political party in future about looking at things like land value taxes and, and land value capture, first, you need to know who owns the stuff. Guy and Anna, we use their work, um, plagiarise their work in terms of developing for the manifesto and the great book that costings was the overseas companies um, levy, uh, which the IFS said would ne not raise a penny and couldn't work until we pointed out actually operates in Singapore, Canada, and a large number of other places as well. So I just want to thank them for the work that they've, they've done. And also, uh, people have forgotten, but PCS is a trade union. Twice running, fought off the campaign to privatise the land registry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, an hour for opening up to the questions of go. Actually, how many? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Just get thrown out. <laughs> in the sense of occupying the office. No. <laughs> thank you, John. Can I, as Mayor of Lincoln, uh, first of all, thank you for carrying this project forward here in Parliament. Last night, my colleague and I, and Karen Lee, the MP for Lincoln, round of applause. <laughs> Lincoln Mail has such a superb MP, can I say. We spoke last night about connecting this issue together, John, in a way I'm sure you would like, because it's very much the sort of profile you're giving. And in fact, our American colleague is, is a great source of comfort to me, because you've talked about the continuous development issue here. So with that night in Lincoln, we talked about the fact that the Charter of the Trees, that you were talking about, the Charter of the Forest, and of course you mentioned the great battle against the French, dare I say, uh, <laughs> where we in Lincoln defeated them in the, in the pursuit of a certain kind of liberty. But nonetheless, we link that then also to the fact that right through, we're talking about liberty, we're talking about right through to universal suffrage, we're talking about the very issues upon which the Labour Party is founded. And that, in my head, is where we started. And then there is the process that's been described tonight 
are caring around the development of democracy. So I'm really grateful that tonight, in this place, we have highlighted those very issues. So thank you very much. movement that restores our commons and so spaces both you know in nature and the forest and within the urban common spaces we've lost so many for our schools and community centers and libraries being closed so um, really need to urge that we've got a massive network in this room and beyond and uh, being a very practical direct action person I really want to ask the panel what is the next steps to building a mass movement we stand in a long Tradition here, we, when we occupied Runnymede Eco Village, we were told by a professor that actually, you know, the Charter of the Forest was, and the Magna Carta was a push from the ordinary people for the return of their rights to land, and, you know, from the levellers and the diggers and the suffragettes, right up to the present day, even the squatters after World War II, pushing for access to land and homes. It's getting really dire out there. Street homelessness has doubled since they've been like squatting, which is the right to shelter and empty buildings. 
So basically, my question is to panel and to everyone here, is what are the next steps to building a mass movement to create and, and support this chart of the commons? Is there a meeting next spring or early summer? I know there's land occupations being planned next year, and we're going to occupy as many empty non-commercial buildings and residential buildings as possible to push for this, and we hope that John McDonald and the Labour Party from their part can push as well. And everyone push together because we need these commons restored so that we have spaces to help each other and help the environment. So my question panel is, when is the next stage of building this movement? Is there a conference or a meeting in the spring when we come to the land occupation action okay. or the summer? I'm going to stay and then we'll, we'll, just like a panel, I'm getting all sorts of signs from the back. <laughs> I'll be really Steve and then I'll just get a panel for a minute each to respond. Okay, okay my name is Steve Batwich. I'm a Labour Council and Nottingham City Council, which set up the first publicly owned not-for-profit energy company since 1948. Yeah. 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 Taking back control of our energy, robbed from us by Thatcher when the advertising campaign of Tel Sid and all the rest of it took, took away something we already owned, you know? And uh, really proud that we've set it up with no private shareholders, no paid directors, with the core aim of bringing down energy prices for the people who can least afford to pay energy like prepayment customers. So, you know, not called Robin Hood Energy for no reason. <laughs> Please go out and support it. It's available all around the country and we can challenge the big six if people with their own pocket switch to a publicly owned energy company. At the moment, there's only Robin Hood Energy or Bristol Energy who is doing that. Thank you very much. Thanks on time. I just want to get the panel to respond a minute each. Sure. Well, so very briefly on, on how we get a people movement. Um, I can only speak from the experience around the Charter of uh, the Trees with some people, but emulating what the Charter of the Forest achieved, um, these things, the real change is going to have to happen through uh, action from the top, from government policy change. However, it's only going to happen with pressure from beneath, and that's what the Charter of the Forest of 1217 really demonstrated. So um, what we try to do with this is have a set of aspirations behind which everyone, no matter what their priority and their agenda, <coughs> can agree that those are the things we should aspire to do. And then that means you've got such a huge weight of social and public opinion behind those principles that when it comes to the nuts and bolts of actually making those changes uh, and the specifics that have to be carried, on, carried out by the experts at the highest levels, um, you've got that weight behind you, you've got that pressure um, which needs to be felt from above for those things to be changed. So I would say as a, as, as a point of principle, take inspiration from the past but move it into the future. Uh, yeah, I would just like to say that with all the points that you've made, in terms of your point about building a movement, um, there's a to-do list that Marcelo and Ryan Comma do, uh, have put down, and uh, it's getting people together, it's about testing, putting something out there as a test, so um, that's the kind of work that we've had these debates is going to be engaged in following this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two points. I'd first like to recognise Ronnie Cowan at the back there, a very good friend from Scotland, MP. I hope he will be taking forward some of these issues. And there are a number of friends here. The, I want to just respond to this, your question. We're trying to draft Julie's contributing, I'm contributing, and others are contributing, a draft charter of the commons. Mm -hmm. What would a charter of the commons in the 21st century look like? Where would we put our priorities? Where would we set demands? How would we develop the governance, the assembly ideas, to protect the commons? And everybody here is invited to contribute their half pennyworth Please send us, uh, by email or otherwise, some ideas, because we've got some, but we know that you are uh, the, the catalysts for this. In November the 11th, in Lincoln, we're going to have a conference where we're specifically concentrating on what the contents of that might look like. But it's the beginning of a process, and it will be going on over the next few months. So I really urge you all to contribute and we've already had some fantastic ideas this evening so thank you very much yeah as a, a thank you i just had a, a couple points to make um just to think about the
Charter of the Forest doesn't actually mention rights. Mm. It speaks of powers. Mm -hmm. And I just want us to think about the difference. You know, it has to do with law and capacity. Yeah? And that might relate to uh, the brothers, the Ranmeed uh, villagers yeah. call to us for help. The other thing I wanted to mention, thinking of the woods, is a chemical approach to history. I think our oxygen, of course, when you spoke, comes from the woods. On the other hand, it's carbohydrates, isn't it? Car carbon, and we know now it's the oil, isn't it? And then in between it was the coal, looking back at the history. Yeah. And the oil goes through flows around the planet. So I think our common aim must, nowadays, must include that source of energy too. And that's an international thing, isn't it? Yes, so thank, thank you. Just really to talk, uh, speak very briefly to the point that Pete, you made about a new land movement, because I think it's very exciting. There is a new land movement that's getting getting underway in this country that's bringing together both rural and urban land issues, housing and food and nature and climate. And just two things that I really urge people to Google and to join. Land Justice Network, and please subscribe to The Land magazine, which is a fantastic <laughs> magazine. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad food has been mentioned, because we're now going to have a drink, maybe a sandwich as well. Can I thank all the speakers? Thank you very much. For those who haven't had the opportunity to ask questions and make contributions, everyone will be around for a while now. Come and have a chat with people now. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you. Okay, guys, thank you so much for being with us. I'll see if I can actually talk to some of the occupiers, see what they think and what they will be doing next. But in any case, please, if you could uh, send this off, you know, to people who may be interested in uh, what's happening in this country, who owns England, partner debates, and that one. Okay, yes, I'll be. Occupy London, new party debates. Peace out.